kangaroo and human genomes. There's an article that appeared in 2008, although the main article actually appeared in 2011, as we'll see, and why the difference, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it was a Reuters article coming from Australia. Um, by the way, for those of you who are interested, the, uh, the uh, Animal Picture Society um, took this uh, photo and, uh, uh, of a uh, wallaby. And the uh, thing is, in, is under technology, and as you can see, it's in 2008, and it says kangaroo genes close to humans. And this is what initially got me interested in this particular um, subject, uh, kangaroo genes close to humans. Australia's kangaroos are genetically similar to humans and may have first evolved in China, Australian researchers said Tuesday. Scientists said they had for the first time mapped the genetic code of the Australian marsupials and found much of it was similar to the genome for humans the government-backed Center for Excellence for Kangaroo Genomics said. There are a few differences. We have a few more of this, a few less of that, but they are the same genes, and a lot of them are in the same order, said a director, Jenny Graves, told reporters in Melbourne. Uh, we thought they'd be completely scrambled, but they're not. There's great chunks of a human genome which is sitting right there in the kangaroo genome, Graves said, according to AP. I don't know whose English that was. Humans and kangaroos last shared an ancestor at least 150 million years ago, the researchers found. By the way, as you'll find out, it's not quite 150 million years ago. But while well, mice and humans diverged from one another only 70 million years ago. Kangaroos first evolved in China but migrated across the Americas to Australia and Antarctica, they said. Now that's an interesting claim. I assume that they found something in China. I don't know whether they found kangaroos in the Americas. Uh, although it's interesting to me to ask the question, if they're in China, were they on their way from the Ark to Australia? And there are those who claim that you don't find kangaroos between uh, the Ark and Australia, but apparently you do, or at least, you know, a little bit to the side. Uh, I find that interesting, and eventually it would be interesting to find out where have kangaroos been found. Kangaroos are hugely informative about what we were like 150 million years ago, Graves said. And at the end, of the, there's a picture of a couple of kangaroos. Now, <clears throat> I could not find a, uh, an article from 2008. Um, I did find one from 2011. It's uh, Renfri et al. Uh, genome sequence of an Australian kangaroo, Macropus eugenii, provides insight into the evolution of mammalian reproduction and development, genome biology. And that's available on the net if you want it. And uh, there's, uh, it's actually a wallaby, which is a small kangaroo, if you like. I guess there are several different varieties, and they folk div divided up into wallabies, wallaroos, and kangaroos, depending on how big they are, I think. And uh, as you can see, this one has a little marker on him or her, I guess, because she's got a joy with her. Um, here's another photo, and there is a little bitty wallaby. That's, by the way, found in uh, Biomed Central. Um, <clears throat> now, the et al., as you can see, there's quite a list of authors. In fact, the list of authors is so big that they had to put a correction. And that's the real list of authors. And if you're wondering what the difference is, it's uh, this little gentleman right here that got left out. So um, 
There's another one that I want to point out, and that is uh, down near the bottom, Jennifer Graves is one of the authors as well. So uh, the abstract starts out with background. We present the genome sequence of the Tamar wallaby, Macropus eugenii, which is a member of the kangaroo family and the first representative of the iconic hopping mammals that symbolize Australia to be sequenced. <coughs> the Tamar has many unusual biological characteristics, including the longest period of embryonic diapause of any mammal, extremely synchronized seasonal breeding, and prolonged and sophisticated lactation within a well-defined pouch. Like other marsupials, it gives birth to highly altricial young. I assume that that's poorly developed. Sort of like kittens, only uh, obviously, as you saw in the photo, a lot uh, more primitive, so to speak. And has a small number of very large chromosomes, making it a valuable model for genomics, reproduction, and development. Result, the genome has been sequenced to two times coverage using Sanger sequencing enhanced with additional next generation sequencing with the, addition, with the integration of extensive physical and linkage maps to build the genome assembly. We also sequenced the Tamar transcriptome across many tissues and development time points. Our analysis of these data shed light on mammalian reproduction, development, and genome evolution. There is innovation in reproductive and lactational genes, rapid evolution of germ cell genes, and incomplete locus-specific X inactivation. We also observe novel retrotransposons and a highly rearranged major histo histocompatibility complex with many class I genes located outside the complex. It's not all together in the same place like it is in humans. Um, Novel microRNAs in the Tamar Hox clusters uncover new potential mammalian Hox regulatory elements. Conclusions analysis of these analyses of these re resources enhance our understanding of marsupial gene evolution, identify marsupial specific conserved non coding elements and critical genes across a range of biological systems, including reproduction, development, and immunity and provide new insight into marsupial and mammalian biology and genome evolution. So it gives you a kind of overview of where they're coming from and where they're going. Kangaroo genome background. The Tamar wallaby holds a unique place in the natural history of Australia, for it was the first Australian marsupial discovered, and the first in which its special mode of reproduction was noted. Quote, their manner of procreation is exceeding strange and highly worth observing. Below the belly, the female carries a pouch into which you may put your hand. Inside the pouch are her nipples, and we have found that the young ones grow up in this pouch with the nipples in their mouths. We've seen some of the young ones lying there, which were only the size of a bean, <coughs> though at the same time perfectly proportioned so that it seems certain they grow there out of the nipples of the mammae from which they draw their food until they're grown up. These observations were made by Francisco Pelsart, captain of the ill-fated and mutinous Dutch East Indies ship Batavia in 1629, while shipwrecked on the uh, Abrolhos Islands off the coast of Geraldton in Western Australia. It is therefore appropriate that the Tamar should be the first Australian mar marsupial subject to an in-depth anal genome analysis. I'm sorry. And, uh, this is the, um, uh, that's the opossums, and they're in South America and, of course, also in North America. And uh, in Australia, you can see that there's a number of different wombats, um, uh, koalas, uh, over here, the Tasmanian devil, and various other um, uh, marsupials, but the one they're concentrating now on is the kangaroo or wallaby. Uh, and they figure that since these were connected, that marsupials were together and then separated at one Gondwana land, separated. And you can see uh, the one we're talking about, the Tamar wallaby, is part of the, the same genus includes the red kangaroo, and I think it's a gray kangaroo here, and uh, 
then there are a few kind of uh, hair kangaroos and stuff like that that are a little further, a little more distantly related. It'll be interesting to see what their genomes are like and how they compare, partly because um, I suspect that at a certain point we might be able to tell um, the, um, the size relations of a biblical kind in this particular instance. <coughs> but to continue on with the article, marsupials are distantly related to eutherian mammals, having shared a common ancestor between 138 and 148 million years ago. Notice that's less than 150 million years. So you don't always believe the press releases. The Tamar wallaby Micropus eugenii is a small member of the kangaroo family, the Macropodidae, within the genus Macropus, which just means Bigfoot. So Bigfoot does exist in Australia, uh, <coughs> which comprises uh, 14 species. The Macropodids are the most specialized of all marsupials. Mature females weigh about five to six kilos, and males up to nine kilos. That's about 20 pounds. So the, we're talking pretty small animals. The tamar is highly abundant in its habitat on Kangaroo Island in South Australia and is also found on the Abrojos Islands, which of course is where he was originally found. Uh, Garden Island and the Research uh, Archipelago, all in Western Australia. Notice they're all islands for whatever reason. As well as a few small areas in the southwest corner of the continental mainland. These populations had been separated for at least 40,000 years. Um, I assume that they are saying not further than that because they uh, are too close uh, to each other in in uh, construction. It, its size, availability, and ease of handling have made it the most intensively studied model marsupial for a wide variety of genetic, developmental, reproductive, physiological, biochemical, neurobiological, and ecological studies. And there's a list of studies. In the wild, female kangaroo island hammers have a si highly synchronized breeding cycle and deliver a single young on or about the 22nd of January. Now, remember, this is the middle of the summer. One gestation period after the longest day in the Southern Hemisphere, the 21 to 22 December. That remains in the pouch for nine to 10 months. The mother mates within a few hours after birth, um, but development of the resulting embryo is delayed during an 11 month period of suspended animation, uh, animation called embryonic diapause. What that means is that the the embryos grow to a certain point and then you stop. And then they wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and finally they start growing again. Initially diapause is maintained by a lactation mediated inhibition. The mother's producing milk while she uh, doesn't want another baby around I guess. And in the uh, second half of the year by a photoperiod mediated inhibition that is removed as the day decreases. Um, so that's why right after December 21, um, once the days start to actually noticeably shorten um, in Australia, the, uh, the baby is born. The anatomy, physiology, embryology, endocrinology, and genetics of the Tamara have been described in detail throughout development. And again, a bunch of references. <coughs> The marsupial mode of reproduction exemplified by the tamar with a short gestation and a long lactation does not imply inferiority. What is that for? Nor does it represent a transitory evolutionary stage as was originally thought. Oh, the evolutionists thought this was primitive and uh, so it really isn't necessary anymore. And it's kind of old fashioned, I guess. It is a successful and adaptable lifestyle. You can hear the Australians saying, wait a minute, these, peop these uh, critters are actually uh, perfectly normal. The maternal investment is minimal during the relatively brief pregnancy and in early lactation, allowing the mother to respond to altered environmental conditions. The tamar, like all marsupials, has a fully functional placenta that makes hormones to modulate pregnancy 
and parturition, control the growth of the young, and provide signals for the maternal recognition of pregnancy. The Tamar the tamar embryo develops for only 26 year, days after diapause and is born when only 16 to 17 millimeters long. It's a little over half an inch. And uh weighing about 440 milligrams at a developmental stage half a gram. And you thought half a kilo for a human baby was small. <coughs> And uh, a developmental stage roughly equivalent to a 40-day human or a 15-day mouse embryo. The kidney bean-sized newborn has well-developed forelimbs that allow it to climb up to the mother's pouch where it attaches to one of four available teats. It has functional, though not fully developed, olfactory, respiratory, circulatory, and digestive systems. So it can breathe on its own but it is born with an embryonic kidney, so it doesn't have a kidney yet, really, at least uh, not a functioning one, and uh, a fully functioning one, and undifferentiated immune, thermoregulatory, and reproductive systems, all of which become functionally di differentiated during the length lengthy pouch life. Most major structures and organs, including the hind limbs, eyes, gonads, and a significant portion of the brain, differentiate while the young is in the pouch, and are therefore available for study. They also have a sophisticated lactational physiology with a milk composition that changes throughout pouch life, ensuring that nutrient supply is perfectly matched for each stage of development. Adjacent teached in a pouch can deliver milk of different compositions, appropriate for a pouch young and a young at foot. So you can make embryonic or whatever you want to call it, milk in regular um, milk, useful for a joey that can run around a little bit. Kangaroo chromosomes excited some of the earliest comparative cytological studies of mammals. Like other kangaroos, the tamar has a low diploid number, 2n equals 16, so it means eight pairs of chromosomes. And very large chromosomes that are easily distinguished by size and morphology. The low diploid number of marsupials makes it easy to study mitosis, cell cycles, DNA replication, radiation sensitivity, genome stability, chromosome elimination, and chromosome evolution. Marsupial sex chromosomes are particularly informative. The X and Y chromosomes are small. The basic X chromosome constitutes only 3% of the haploid genome, which is compared to 5% in the eutherians, and we're going to see why in a little bit. And the Y is tiny. Comparative studies show that the marsupial X and Y are representative of the ancestral mammalian X and Y chromosomes. I thought the Y was originally a full-size chromosome and then degenerated to where it is. Apparently, the Y was always tiny. However, in the kangaroos, a large heterochromatic nucleolus organizer region became fused to the X and Y. So they got some extra material in their X and Y chromosomes. Chromosome painting confirms the extreme conservation of kangaroo chromosomes and their close relationship with karyotypes of more distantly related marsupials, so the genome studies are likely to be highly transferable across marsupial species. They're all the same. Well, not quite, but close. The tamar is a member of the Australian marsupial clade and as a macropotted ant marsupial is maximally divergent from the only other sequence model marsupial, the, di the didelphid Brazilian gray short-tailed opossum. Opossum from Brazil, Monodelphius domestica. The South American and Australian marsupials followed independent evolutionary pathways after the separation of Gondwana into the new continents of South America and Australia about 80 million years ago. That's the standard theory. <coughs> and after the divergence of Tamar and Opossum. The Australian marsupials have many unique specializations. Detailed knowledge of the biology of the tamar has informed our interpretation of its genome and highlighted many novel aspects of marsupial evolution. Sequencing and assembly. 
the genome of a female tamer of Kangaroo Island, South Australia. Origin was sequenced using the whole genome shotgun approach in Sanger sequencing. And I'm not going to bore you with all those details. Uh, Tamer genome size, the Tanner, ge Tanner genome size, Tamer genome size was estimated using three independent methods, direct assessment by quantitative PCR, bivariate flow karyotyping and standard flow cytometry, and genome-based analysis based on the Sanger WGS reads using an atlas genom genometer. So they tried different ways of measuring it. And uh, mapping data were used to construct Tamer human and Tamara opossum comparative maps in order to study genome evolution. Regions of the genome were identified that have undergone extensive rearrangement when comparisons between Tamara and opossum are made. These are in addition to a previously known rearrangements based on chromosome specific paints. For example, Tamara chromosome 3 consisting of genes that are on nine human chromosomes, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10, so forth, uh, and the X have an, extensing, have an extensive reshuffling of the gene order, but not all of them. And here's a kind of a, a match, and you will see the chromosome 1, which is yellow. Now, there's another light yellow here, so I think that's the light yellow, but I'm not sure. Um, you'd have to do some. Is all part of chromosome 2, along with a good share of human chromosome 2 being... Uh, uh, mostly together here with a little bit on chromosome 6. Now, here's the X chromosome, and you're wondering why it was a little shorter than average. Well, that's because part of its material has been moved to chromosome 5. As you can see, here's X. And uh, so you can study that. Interestingly, the, the major histocompatibility locus is on 2, but as you can see, there's all kinds of histocompatibility genes scattered throughout all the chromosomes, <coughs> which is not typical for humans. Uh, rearrangements on the remaining chromosomes are mostly the result of large-scale inversions. This enabled us to predict the ancestral marsupial karyotype, revealing that inversions and microinversions have played a major role in shaping the genomes of marsupials. Uh, this is interesting because this is not the first time or the last time you'll see this. Uh, well, maybe it's the first time but uh, in the article, but this whole bunch of stuff and then J.M. Graves' unpublished results. So they have a lot of stuff that they didn't actually reference, and this is, of course, three years after the release of the uh, comments. The ensemble gene build for the MUG 1.0 assembly identified 18,258 genes by projection from high-quality reference genomes. Let's remember humans have about 20,000, and realizing that they have got the complete sequence, eh, it's pretty close to what humans have. Of these, 15,290 are protein coding, 14,000, uh, pardon me, 1,496 are predicted pseudogenes, 525 are microRNA genes, and 42 are long non-coding RNA genes, though these are composed of just seven different families. So there's a bunch of stuff that code for protein, but now there's a bunch of genes that don't code for protein. <coughs> Expansion of gene families. Many genes evolve and acquire novel functions through duplication and divergence. We identify genes that have undergone expansions in the marsupial lineage but remain largely unduplicated in eutherians and reptiles. So some of these are there are two copies or three copies or whatever in, uh, in marsupials and not in reptiles or mammals. Both the tamar and opossum have undergone expansions of MHC class 2 genes, critical in the immune recognition of extracellular pathogens, and TAP genes that are responsible for loading endogenously derived antigens onto MHC class 1 proteins. So it's, the immune system has been reworked a little bit. Um, 
sequence conservation. We next explored sequence conservation between tamarin and opossum using sequence similarity as a sensitive model of conservation. We found that 38% of nucleotides in the tamar genome could be aligned to the high quality opossum genome. Of the aligned sequence, 72% was unannotated, reflecting a high proportion of conserved non-coding regions between the marsupial species. Not only are the coding sequences aligned, but the non-coding sequences are pretty well aligned too. Opossum chromosome X has the most conserved sequence compared to Tamar, 40% more or less, despite the high level of rearrangement between Tamar and Opossum X. So there's a bunch of rearrangement, but, the, but a lot of it is, is rearranged and not, and not lost in either one. Intriguingly, the proportion of conserved sequence on opossum chromosome X that is located in unannotated regions, uh, annotated just simply means that they've figured out what it is, kind of, um, is also the highest of any chromosome, 28.2% despite the level of rearrangement. This may indicate a significant number of non-coding regulatory elements on the X chromosome. GC content, we're going to skip over that stuff, repeats the total proportion of repetitive sequence. This is the signs and lines that you may have heard of from Bob Miloshenko. Uh, it was found to be 52.8%, a little over half although this is probably an underestimate resulting from the low coverage. They've still got some work to go. This is similar to the repeat contents of the opossum genome, which is 52.2%. The proportion of lines and signs was also similar between opossum and tamar. However, the overall content for long terminal repeat elements was significantly below that observed for any other mammal, only 3.91%. With the exception of the platypus, which is less than one percent, less than half a percent, the unique si small size of the Tamar centromere, estimated to cover only 450 kilobases, the centromeres are smaller than everybody else's. Interesting. The Tamar transcriptome, highly divergent or Tamar-specific transcripts, and we're going to go based on stringent alignments to Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genome Genes, a value of 10 to the minus 30, it was initially estimated that up to 17% of ovary clusters, 22% of testis clusters, 29% of gravid uterus clusters, and 52% of hypothalamus clusters were tamar-specific or highly divergent. That's kind of orphan genes. Unique genes were identified by clustering of the EST, or uh, to be precise, expressed sequence tag libraries to remove redundancy, followed by alignment of the unique reads to DBEST with blastin using an E-value threshold of 10 to the minus 5. Little uh, technical speak there. We identified 4,678 unique ESTs from a total of 76,171 input ESTs. Four out of, not quite five out of 75,000. What's that? Um, uh, 15 times, 16 times, something like that. And uh, use these for further analysis. Sequences were translated using ORF predictor and passed through PFAMA for classification. Of the unique genes that could be classified using this approach, many appear to be receptors or transcriptional regulators. A large number of unique ESTs contained whey acidic protein and lipid domains common in milk proteins, suggesting a rapid diversica diversification of these genes in the Tamar genome. Remember, this is an animal that puts out different kinds of milk depending on how old the milk uh, receiver is. Uh, so there has to be rapid diversification of these genes because if it wasn't diverse, well, then it was rapid creation, and we're not going there. Um, an EST <coughs> containing unique zona pellucida domain was also identified, which raises an interesting question. Zona pellucida presumably is necessary for, uh, um, for uh, uh, 
oocyte function. And it makes you wonder uh, what the Tamron Wallaby did before they had that zona pellucida domain. Now this is a really interesting figure. I think it's fi figure 5B. And uh, if you look at it, you think that, oh, the brain must be very similar and the liver must be very similar and the ovary is not quite so similar and the testis is very dissimilar. But that's not actually what this shows. The color code is precisely reversed. That is, uh, microRNA overlap is high in the testis of Homo sapiens versus the uh, testis of, uh, of uh, Tamron wallabies. And the brain is not. And you're going, well, wait a minute. Why is this is um, uh, that's platypus. This is the um, uh, oh, opossum. You'd think those would be more closely related, right? And, uh, you know, rat, uh, rat uh, chimpanzee, human, the human has the highest overlap. And um, I am not making this up. Um, part of the figure says a high degree of overlap, that is, conservation, was observed between tamar and human for fibroblast and testis, but a relatively low overlap was observed for the brain. So that is what that means. And now you're going, what? Ovary, testis, and brain are actually most similar to humans. Figure that one out. More than a possum, more than uh, more than platypus. Small RNAs and uh, immunity. Uh, the organization of the Tamar MHC is vastly different from other, that of other mammals. Rather than forming a single cluster, MHC genes are found on every chromosome except the sex chromosomes. Figure two: the MHC itself is found in chromosome 2q and contains 132 genes spanning four megabytes. Two, figure two is that one that had all the um, chromosomes with their human matches. At birth, the altricial pouch young is exposed to a variety of different bacterial species in the pouch. There's a little bitty babies, and they've got E. coli and Acinetobacter and Carinobacteria. To survive in this pathogen-laden environment, the immunologically naive neonate is reliant on immune factors which are transmitted from the mother through the milk. The sequencing of the genome uncovered a family of cathelicidin genes which are expressed in the mammary gland during the lactation and encode powerful antimicrobial pep peptides. These peptides may provide unique opportunities to develop novel therapeutic, uh, therapeutics against emerging multidrug-resistant superbugs. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with, um, with the question of time, but it does... It is an interesting medical fact. Uh, <clears throat> marsupial sex chromosomes have been shown to represent the ancestral sex chromosomes to which an autosomal region was fused early in the eutherian radiation. Thus, the basic marsupial X shares homology with the, uh, the long arm and paracentric region of the human X. The Tamar Y sh uh, shares only five genes with the degraded eutherian Y and figure five, and here's figure five, and this is really interesting. You will notice that for the opossum, there's a whole bunch of, there's a complete rearrangement of the X chromosome. Um, for the Tamar wallaby versus the opossum, they're pretty close to parallel, although there's a little bit of rearrangement. You can see three genes were drawn together, and then one gene was completely misplaced up there. Now, interestingly, the human X and Y have um, four in the human uh, uh, genes that overlap. Inter uh, interestingly, also for the wallaby, the Y has a whole bunch of genes that are scattered throughout the X that are concentrated in that little bitty P uh, section here. And the devil Y is virtually identical to the Tamar wallaby Y except for the tail end, whatever that's doing. 
Marsupial sex chromosomes lack the autosomal addition and so are expected to be smaller than those of eutherian mammals. The opossum X is about 97 megabases. The larger size of the Tamar X, 150 megabases, reflects the addition of a heterochromatic arm containing satellite repeats in the nucleolus organizing region. So the X got a little extra stuff there, which appears to be necessary. Of the 451 protein coding genes on the opossum X chromosome, 302 of the orthologs in the Tamar ensemble gene belt. So about you know, two-thirds of them. The gene mapping indicates that the gene order within the Tamarex is scrambled with respect to both the opossum and the human X chromosomes. And as you can see, although the opossum is not quite as scrambled. The scrambling of the marsupial X contrasts to the eutherian X chromosome, which is almost identical in gene content and order between even the most distantly related taxa. So it's completely rearranged. Uh, Presumably, uh, between uh, uh, 150, uh, not quite, and 80 years ago, there was a whole bunch of scrambling, and then all of a sudden, from there on, the X was fixed, which, of course, is the exact reverse of the Y in uh, human versus chimpanzee, where it, there's not that much difference between a lot of other ones, and then all of a sudden, you hit the human and chimp, and they're completely rearranged. So the rigid conservation of the Ethereum X was hypothesized to be the result of strong purifying selection against rearrangement that might interrupt a chromosome-wide mechanism to affect X chromosome inactivation. Consistent with this hypothesis, inactivation on the scrambled marsupial X is incomplete, locus-specific, and does not appear to be controlled by an inactivation center although the kangaroos seem to do just fine with, without those things. So how you have purifying selection when it doesn't actually kill the animal is not clear. But in many marsupial species, the Y chromosome is a minute element of about 12 megabases. The Tamar Y is larger as a result of addition of the X and Y in the early macropotted radiation to, of a heterochromatic lung arm that contained the nuclear organizing region and nor associated repeats. Presumably all that white stuff is those things. The Tamar Y chromosome bears at least 10 genes which are all located on the tiny short arm of the Y. And uh, again, here's another one of these unpublished results which is really interesting. All 10 have orthologs on the Y of a distantly related Australian Dasyurid marsupial, the Tasmanian devil implying that the marsupial Y chromosome is conserved. Well, except for what's been added to it. It has degraded more slowly than the eutherian Y, which retains only four human or five other animals, uh, mammals' genes from the ancient XY pair. Like most genes in the human Y, all of these tamar Y genes have an X partner from which they clearly diverged. Some Tamar Y genes are expressed exclusively in the testis, for example, marsupial-specific et tree, but most have widespread expression. Phylogenetic analysis of the X and Y copies of these 10 Tamar XY genes indicate that the marsupial Y genes have a complex evolutionary history. Now, what does that mean? That means that it doesn't make sense, and they're still trying to figure it out. X chromosome inactivation, reproductive genes, we're going to skip over a bunch of stuff here, germ cells. Um, comparative analysis of genes essential for mouse and human germ cell development using the Tamar genome present an, uh, presented an unexpected paradox. It was presumed that the genes mediating germ cell specification and development in mammals would be highly conserved because this cell lineage is, crit is critical for species survival. However, our analysis indicate that many genes are rapidly evolving and likely to be controlled by specific elements in each mammalian lineage. They thought that there would be very little difference. Come to find out there's a big difference, which raises an interesting question. How do you conserve something that doesn't actually need to be that particular? 
and uh, spermatogenesis genes, developmental genes, pluripotential genes. I'm going to just uh, skip through a bunch of stuff and uh, uh, then come to the conclusion. The tamar, a small kangaroo species, is a model Australian marsupial that has played a particularly important role in the, city of in the study of reproduction, development, immunity, and the evolution of mammalian sex chromosomes. Here we have presented its genome sequence and associated resources, including transcriptome sequence data from a range of tissues. Together, these data have provided new insights into a host of important gene families. We identified a novel tamar specific as well as conserved but previously undiscovered and microRNAs that regulate the Hox genes, a novel sign class that is RNA derived and a novel class of small RNAs. So they have brand new stuff. We show that there has been expansion of several gene families, especially the MHC and OR genes, and that there are several that there are features that are of specific importance to marsupials, such as the innovation of genes in lactation, because they have to switch the milk to accommodate the growing baby, and the presence of genomic imprinting in the mammary gland. However, there is High conservation in testicular and ovarian genes, one of which DHH is only the second mammal-specific gonadal development gene so far developed, identified. The Y chromosome is minute but relatively gene-rich and conserved in marsupials. The X chromosome represents the ancestral mammalian X and perhaps an ancestral stochastic dosage compensation that operates within, without an X chromosome in activation center. These initial uh, tamar genome analyses have already provided many unique insights into the evolution of the mammalian genome. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, highlights the importance of this emerging model system for understanding mammalian biology. Now, there's an interesting. I mean, you you look at this and you're thinking. You know, almost makes you wonder whether there's you know, some design implications for some of this stuff because it, it seems to be the same but not required to be the same. And how you keep that going for 150 million years or whatever is uh, not clear. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But um, there's an interview where Jenny Graves talks about intelligent design and evolution. <coughs> There. And um, again, it's on the web. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. <coughs> and Jenny has had a long and joyful career overcoming a near fatal illness, apparently, and a cerebral bleed, and a coincidental collapse in funding to resurrect her research and eventually being awarded the L'Oreal Prize for Women in Science. She is now head of comparative genomics at the Australian National University in Canberra and director of the Australian Research Center of Excellence for, can for Kangaroo Genomics. But the next few weeks we looked at weren't. Uh, this is, uh, she's talking. <coughs> Which is a big sh uh, shock. It turned out that all the genes on the short arm of the human X are in one place and on autosome in the kangaroo. What on earth does that mean? That immediately told us that the human bit X had an ancient bit and a recent bit. Well, I mean, what else can it be? And that was interesting because it solved a lot of problems. The human X is really strange because the top bit doesn't act like an X at all. It's full of genes that aren't inactivated, and that's because they haven't been on the X for very long. Well, at least that's uh, the theory. So that told me something that's been with me my whole life long, which is that sometimes when you ask a functional question, you get an evolutionary answer. And this has become a guiding principle. Sometimes things are the way they are not because they work better, but because that's the way they evolved and you can guess function by asking a gene where it has been in the last hundred million years. Nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. Skipping on down a little bit, I started out in molecular genetics and was greatly in awe of evolutionary biologists who seemed to have their heads in the clouds. 
I didn't think we even belonged on the same planet. But it never dawned on me how relevant evolutionary thinking was. I didn't think, I didn't realize how all of the answers came from evolution. Well, of course they do if you don't allow any other answers. It's been a real thrill to plug my work into a much bigger framework of how genomes evolved. And then skipping over quite a bit, it really amused me to be told once that our nature paper on platypus sex hormones was featured on the Discovery website. <clears throat> and I said, oh, that's wonderful. And they said, well, maybe you don't know that the Discovery website is creationist and your paper is put on there as an example of an intelligent design. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And that was the inspiration for my dumb design website, which I'm setting up now with my L'Oreal prize money. See, if you get extra money, this is what you do with it. Which I'm setting up now with my, uh, as, as examples of how evolution can explain things very simply that seem to make no functional sense at all. So that's going to be my first example of something that happened once accidentally and now can't unhappen, but how systems work around those accidents uh, uh, to make the best of a bad job. See, it truly really distresses me to see kids being brought up to believe in utter nonsense, referring to creationism and intelligent design. Uh, get you, is that true in Australia too? And she says, not as true in Australia as in the U.S., but there is a lot of pressure to accept the teaching of utter nonsense in school. I think we are raising a credulous generation who will believe anything as long as they read it in the Reader's Digest. It's so dangerous to encourage people to believe what they are told rather than what they observe. I don't know, have you noticed all those creationist articles in the Reader's Digest? Uh, and uh, skipping over that. Now, my own take from this, I think there are a lot of genetic parallels between kangaroos and humans. Uh, th this fact is surprising, especially in light of the fact that there are some major discrepancies as well. One could see these facts as arguing against common descent and for at least partly common design because otherwise you can't explain the similarities in view of the differences. <coughs> now, Jenny Graves, and I'm not picking on her because she's, uh, there are a lot of people that feel the way she does, uh, doesn't see things that way. And her major argument ad against design seems to be that the design is imperfect. Interesting. We get back to theodicy. As Cornelius Hunter has said, religion drives science, and it matters. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Obviously, there's a number of genes that are similar in kangaroos and humans. And a number of gene structures as well. Yeah. Now, the question I raise is, is this different than with other mammals and humans? Or are we to expect similar genes in all mammals, in fact, all living things, uh, is this, is this a significant surprise here, or is this just a, a fact that we find similar genes everywhere? <clears throat> and I'm not a bit surprised at finding similar genes everywhere, as long as you're dealing with living things, the same biochemistry, bones, uh, tissues the same, and so on. You're going to find an awful lot that's together. Because in uh, order to create an animal, you have to have certain things. But is the kangaroo closer to man than, than the others? That's, that's the question I'm asking. It all depends on which tissues you're looking at. <clears throat> if it's a testis, we are. So we're just a bunch of kangaroos. The men yeah. are. Yeah, but there's more to the kangaroo than just that. <laughs> I know. I, it is, it's kind of weird to, to look at it. And what's even more weird is to see that apparently the X chromosome from the you know, kangaroo to, the, to most mammals is, is pretty much reorganized. Same stuff mostly, but uh, reorganized. And then suddenly it hit mammals and it, it doesn't reorganize in the next 80 million years. 
Now, why is that? Because it doesn't seem to be a functional constraint. I mean, a kangaroo does just fine with its differently organized um, X. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, I mean, some of this stuff looks like it doesn't really fit that well with common descent. And design would be an easier way to explain some of this. Well, that's, that's just the point I'm uh, trying to make here, that uh, you can explain this at least uh, similarities by common design. Why in the world would a designer make a different gene pattern for the same function or the same structure? Uh, if he has something that works in one animal, why not use it in another? Well, I, you know, it's an intelligent question. It raises the question whether um, some examples of horizontal gene transfer are, um, if I can put it that way, assisted horizontal gene transfer. You know, I like this enzyme over here in the mouse. Hey, that works pretty well. Let's uh, use the same design for chimpanzees and for humans. Or better yet, as in the case of rice, I need an extra opsin. I'll just borrow it from the bacteria. But similarity is a good argument for monotheism. Yeah. He argues that uh, it's either the same designer or at least designers that consult very well together were, were doing all this stuff. <coughs> Comment? I don't know. I don't think I need a microphone. Well, we're recording this actually, so. <laughs> Um, I know I came in at the tail end of this topic, but um, just because something is similar doesn't make it the same or even <coughs> um, When you just look at something that has structure in it, like carbon nanofibers from a plane that they make, just because it has carbon in it, I have carbon in my body, but I'm not the same thing as a plane. And um, in biochemistry, we were looking at some of the path. We were looking at some of the pathways. He helped me, but um, we were looking at some of the pathways, and we were talking about fatty acid synthesis. And one of the things that the body does, um, I can't remember this mainly, but I know glucose comes, and you can break it down to pyruvate and pyruvate gets into the mitochondria. I don't know if it's the liver, I'm trying to remember, but um, it breaks down to citrate. And citrate can pass through the mitochondria membrane and sit out in the cytosol. And I'm like, well, why would, why would God make the body so that it breaks down, glucose breaks down to like a different form of glucose? I mean, that's a waste. But God doesn't waste anything. The citrate that is in the cytosol it, when it's in that form, you get the two NADPHs that are needed for fatty acid synthesis. And so maybe, and I, I can't explain what God does, or I really, really didn't understand even all the X and Y chromosomes and the, the, all that, didn't understand everything. But God does, does have a reason for why he does certain things. And maybe it is just to prove that you just couldn't linearly line this up or explain this by evolution. Well, as a matter of fact, um, um, you will see this all the time. If you have an enzyme in animal A and an enzyme in animal B, and they're identical, the standard answer has been, well, they must have had a common ancestor that had the same enzyme. Why is that? Because enzymes are notoriously hard to create using an evolutionary scenario. 
So they had to inherit it from the same ancestor. And this is why, um, you know, the facts that started suggesting that completely unrelated animals had the same, uh, the same uh, enzyme started people thinking, well, that's good. then it, it has to be horizontal gene transfer because making it up twice is just too hard. Now, of course, if you're a designer, making it up twice is real easy. You just take the blueprints and move them over. And, uh, uh, you know, it's an entirely different way of looking at this. Uh, and that's why, you know, she talks about the young part of the Y, uh, the X chromosome and the old part of the X chromosome. Because you have to do that, otherwise you can't explain why the X chromosome has two parts that are entirely uh, different from each other. You have to say, well, they must have come from a different place. And, and uh, the constraints that are put on you by saying there's no design are really tough. And uh, some of the stuff that, you know, if if you're not as familiar with it, I might just zoom past you, is to realize that there's, what, 4,000 genes or something like that that um, are orphan genes. That is to say, they don't have any relatives in other animals. Now, maybe they're there in, um, uh, say, the red kangaroo or something like that, um, but it's like they're brand new to the whole system of, you know, uh, they're not there in the opossum, they're not there in the monotreme, they're not there in the eutherian mammals, uh, you know, cats, dogs, mice, whatever, um, sheep. They're not there. They're not in humans. Um, and so they're specific for one, either one species or one very closely related group of species. And, you know, how do you get 4,000 new genes? Developing one new gene is horrendous. 4,000? On the other hand, again, if you, have a comp if you have a creator, you just, uh, you know, especially a brilliant creator, you just do it. And it's a whole different way of looking at things. And uh, it's, the thing that I found amazing was at the end, Jenny's reason for not believing was that there's so much that looks to her like clutch that it looks like it's kind of just patched together. Well, uh, you know, there's, there's two things about that. One of them is, if you think it's just patched together, well, the only way you could know for sure is to make your own and show that it isn't really necessary. And we're not at that stage yet most of the time. Uh, it may turn out to be more necessary or, or better, a more elegant design than what we thought. Uh, but the second thing is that even having Deficient design is not an argument against intelligent design. It's just an argument that whoever the designer was, was not perfect. And it's entirely possible that a lot of the things that we have were actually designed by, uh, uh, by entities that are not God, uh, but it doesn't get rid of the requirement for intelligent design. But could I say, I would like to say that also, um, I do believe that God created everything and that sin had effect on um, life and even our bodies and the way that That's right. they respond. So maybe some of the, the, the issues that are dealing with genes that maybe even creationists don't understand has to do with the effect of sin and how all that was rearranged. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. Ford Pintos are designed poorly. They have a gas tank in the back that can explode when, when they're hit from behind. But trust me, Ford Pintos did not evolve because of that. Yes? The uh, article that you discussed, I think, last year about the uh, uh, mice or rat experiment where they fed them uh, material that was uh, genetic material in their food 
and then found that the offspring had incorporated some of that genetic material into their reproductive uh, lines uh, made uh, sense to me as to why God had said there are certain types of foods that we avoid and those are basically the scavenger creatures and you wonder how much of uh, some of that uh, junk chromosomes that uh, show up in the human genome now are materials that were incorporated uh, uh, by some of our ancestors who uh, did not follow that uh, uh, that uh, recommendation, and uh, they they ate uh, ate uh, some uh, some uh, materials that uh, got absorbed uh, by the digestive system, just like the happened to those mice and rat experiment, and we now carry those uh, things around on our uh, reproductive. Uh, uh, genomes uh, that uh, never were there originally, but uh, have been incorporated by uh, uh, eating uh, these uh, food uh, that came from scavengers. I'd, I'll have to confess I don't remember the exact details of that, but I will I will say that it does make a certain amount of sense that that uh, mm. some kinds of uh, DNA are probably better not put in our bodies. I also feel that um, the complexity of the Tasmanian devil um, is, to me, so complex that it couldn't just evolve by chance. To me, with all the different contradictions that they see that the lady is like can't even explain, the fact that it's still alive and it hops or jumps or runs, eats, that's just fine. <laughs> to me, shows an intelligent designer. And the reason why I say that is because that just couldn't be thrown together and work. Um, just for example, if I had a, a whole bunch of Legos and I had a thousand pieces just out there randomly and I decided to take them and say, I want to make this car and I want it to make it run solar power so I don't have to hook up anything to it. I can't just put those Legos in a box and shake the box for a million years and hope that a car comes out that's solar powered, rolling, functioning. That's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I can shake that box for two million, 150 billion years. That's not going to give me the right combination, fit and even if they could just happen to somehow assemble together in the right combination, I would still have to have the circuitry, the wire tree. I'd have to have solar panels. I'd have to have not only all the information, not only all the pieces, I would have to have the information for those pieces, and it would have to be organized in such a way where it produces some type of a function. It can't just, however those, However those genes are designed, is designed, even though it may not be a way that humans can actually say one plus one is two, it works for that particular animal. And God knew it, and that's the way God created it. But see, you don't understand. If you, if you shake it for uh, two days, and then you look inside and you see if you have a car, and then if, and then if you don't, then you close it back up and shake it again. And if you shake it, uh, and if you see a car, then you put the car back in and shake it some more, but eventually you get a better and better car. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm just going to uh, raise the issue here, the basic issue that we're, at least one of the basic issues we're dealing with here, of course, is the uh, God of the Gaps argument the evolutionists or our friends will say anytime you run into a problem you just invoke God and uh, there is a certain logic to that statement uh, but uh, it's uh, too simplistic an approach to reality because reality is much more complex than that uh, what if you do have a God that is powerful 
And what are you going to do about all the problems that we have when you exclude him? And uh, to me, the basic logic is in favor of the fact there is a God. And, and it just comes back to, to some of the basic issues of the fine-tuned universe, the origin of life, yeah. and all this. Uh, and I, I'm not happy when an evolutionist says, well, any time you have a problem, you raise the, the question, you just invoke your God to do it. Uh, and when you uh, try and exclude God, you're into such m tremendously improbable problems that, uh, what if God is powerful? You can't, ex you can't state that he isn't that powerful. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're, you're limiting the possibilities, uh, and in doing so, you, you, uh, your argument is weak. Well, I think there's a more important point than that, and, and this is the thing people don't understand, is once you, it, once you invoke God of the gaps argument, basically what you're saying is, there is no evidence that would convince me of God. Because, uh, because anything that points to God can be, well, if you wait long enough, we'll explain it some other way. It's a little bit like having a geologist who's looking at these things that you know, look remarkably like potsherds. And, uh, and <clears throat> an intelligent design advocate comes along and says, I think those were made by somebody. And he says, no, you can't do that because that would be invoking intelligence and we don't allow intelligence in this, in this field. But what if there is, there are potters and they do make ware and the ware sometimes breaks and then leaves, uh, you know, those kinds of traces. Well, you know, if you insist that all pottery must be explained by, you know, natural forces, then uh, you will never discover that there were ancient people who lived there. You can't, because you've ruled it out to begin with. I like the terminology, uh, God of the necessary gaps versus God of the gaps in general. And when you start invoking God of the necessary gaps, your argument becomes very logical and very quantitative and factual and uh, demonstrates, you know, at least uh, the data is in favor there is a God. Yes. Well, th this is just a joke, but uh, I like a rather simple solution for eternal life. I think I'll just go out and get a box and some Legos and start shaking. Well, and, and you know, it's interesting that you mentioned solar power. If you don't have the, if you don't have the solar panels to put into there, you can shake forever and you're not going to get there. Well, that's point two. You know, um, even if you were somehow to create a car, you're not going to get a car with solar panels unless you have, unless you have the solar panel pieces. Comment uh, again. Uh, no. um, I just want to also touch on a point when this gentleman was talking about how a lot of times when um, an evolution, I guess, is talking to a creationist and they'll say, oh, you're God, you know, anytime you can't explain something, it's God of the gaps and that's what you refer to, faith in God and blah, blah, blah. But faith is important. Whether you believe in God or not, you have faith. Um, even scientists that don't believe in God have faith. Um, when you study mathematics and you take real analysis, there are um, rules that you have to follow in order for the equation or the formula to come out right. And those rules are called axioms. And everybody knows in real analysis, there's about 11 axioms that you have to have in order for whatever problem that you're trying to prove to make sense. If you don't follow those rules, then you don't, you can't prove what you're trying to prove. 
Like for example, in geometry, um, the three axioms are a point, a line, and a plane. And a, an axiom is just a, a, a statement that's an undefined term that is undefinable. It is what it is. You accept it by faith. A line is a line, a point is a point, and a plane is a plane. You can't undefine those because if you do, you, um, you undefine the whole term of geometry. You can't build upon that. And so if you understand that a line looks like this, well, why is a line as a line? You, 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 you mess up the construct for that. And I, the reason why I said that is because one of the reasons why I, I struggle with evolutionists is because when they have gaps, they hide them. And they put them in terms of assumptions and you never know them. But they present evolution as if it is a fact and it's not. That's the problem I have with evolution. At least with creationists, they'll say, you know, we don't have an answer, God must know. But don't try to hide it behind the fact that and state that evolution is all truth when they have bigger holes than um, people who believe in God. They just don't show those holes and reveal them. I hope she comes to class more often. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, talking about evolution. She said, oh, no, we can't uh, allow God in. We can't allow design. I'd be ready to say, okay, um, we'll get as many materials together and see if you can make one. You willing to try? Well, the, the origin of life is the single biggest gap, and it seems to be growing with time rather than shrinking. And that's one of the signs of a necessary gap, I think, is that the more you understand, the more obvious the gap is. And, I mean, think about it. Everything that we do, the way you know that I'm here is because instead of a table, you see a person here. And you use that explanatory uh, thing to fill in. Now, there's a positive there. That is, you see somebody who looks like a person here. There's a negative there. You don't see the table. And the truth of the matter is that the strongest arguments for intelligent design are not just negative. I don't see a table where it is, that's what I should see. But the strongest ones also are what I see instead looks like a person. And so there are positive evidences for design as well as negative. The funny part is the positive evidences for design are recognized by everybody. Dawkins finally, uh, famously said that biology is a study of complicated uh, things that give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. It looks designed. The entire project of evolution is to explain why that design is only apparent. It looks designed. That's positive. Beyond that, if you can't explain it by reference to strange looking tables that come out in the shape of a person, then you're probably better off accepting that there's a person there. And I think the same thing is true for God. That if it looks like God did it, and it doesn't look like natural forces can do it, then you draw the, at least tentatively, you draw the obvious conclusion. And if somebody wants to say, well, wait a minute, you could be wrong, I'll say, okay, sure, I could be wrong. Come back at me with evidence that I'm wrong whenever you want. But just saying, well, you could be wrong isn't good enough. But you see, it's good enough for people who are desperately trying to avoid the conclusion that there is a God. For whatever reason, they don't like the design. Anyway, uh, come back next week and we will uh, be prepared for another subject here.